All righty. Well, let's, uh, let's go over the homework real quick. I understand some people have to leave at 7.30, so uh, we'll uh, shoot to be finished by then for the most part. So homework uh, was, I, I got the right one up, right? Does this look familiar? Yeah? Okay. All right. Uh, anybody want to offer up what, they, what their thoughts were on what a model is? Anyone? Yes, aircraft dynamics people, you know what models are. <laughs> uh, so a model is just any sort of analytical tool that you can use to solve for the characteristics and the uh, behavior of a system. Yeah, good. Do you have a photographic memory? Because, I mean, I think that sounds like exactly what the textbook said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so, so it can be a piece of software. It can be, uh, it can be as simple as um, uh, a, a mechanical engineer I was working with on a program one time. We were trying to, we were trying to figure out how tightly you could uh, bend a cable uh, to get it to fit through this, this tight little area. And he basically made a made a model out of some pieces of wood and, and added that and then took a, a real piece of this cable we were trying to bend and and did some tests to figure out how tight a radius it could bend around and so so it could be as simple as uh, you know a couple blocks of wood could be as complicated as uh, uh, some sort of a representative prototype that behaves you know mimics a certain behavior that you're looking for so whole range of things that could be that could be a model uh, and, uh, and any of those would fit the definition. All right, the next one, uh, sensitivity analysis. Anyone from, yes. <laughs> uh, I had that since I cheated and looked up. I yeah, up okay. <laughs> but well, I as long that. as you admit that you're cheating, then yeah, it's okay to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said that sensitivity analysis is used on the parameters of a model that are uncertain, and the goal is to help reduce uh, the risk with making a wrong decision by kind of seeing what impact those uncertain parameters will have. Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to twist that a little bit into the context of the class because I cheated too. I read ahead, so I know what I'm going to lecture on. But, uh, so the sensitivity analysis as it pertains to this part of the class is, is sort of like that with the addition to where those differences that we're talking about, we're trying to figure out which ones have the most influence on the outcome. All right, so, so we're trying to figure out if there's, if there's some particular input or a variable that we can turn just a little bit and it creates a large difference in the, in the results. All right, now come up when we talk about trade studies in today's class. All right, good stuff. How about, uh, how about the next one? Someone from this side of the classroom, number 28. Describe some of the considerations associated with the initiation of design changes resulting from tests and evaluation. So what are some of those considerations, design changes resulting from tests? What do we have to be worried about? Sure. Uh, effects on other subsystems, uh, how many yep. changes will need to cause other changes based on okay. whether the time cost of it is worth the change that you're making. Okay, very good, yeah. Yeah, cost is always a big question that comes up anytime you're talking about the engineering world. And then uh, you'd also want to figure out, hey, do I need to redo the test or not? Or was, did I get enough out of the test to be able to make this change and then convince people by analysis that I, that I, haven't, that I don't need to rerun the test or you know, something like that? So, yep, all that's good. Uh, number 29 was uh, describe the process associated with the initiation and implementation of design changes. So a little bit about the process. Systems engineering is all about the process. Any thoughts on that? Change management uh, was probably talked about in there. So, uh, so you know, if you're, making, if you're making design changes, it needs to be documented. You need to know how to get back to where you were before you made the change in case the change doesn't have the desired outcome. You know, that, that's one thing that we, we uh, are pay very close attention to with antenna design because antennas are kind of finicky. And so you, if, if you make, you know, four different changes and you don't know which one of those actually was the one that, that had the desired effect, then you got to know how to kind of reset back before that put it back in the configuration that you had been in before so that you can start over again and gradually build up that baseline. So that would be one. Uh, so, but fundamentally what you're looking for here is make sure that you have a good 
documentation system in place so that you know what's been done, if, especially if you have multiple people working on something at the same time, you know, who, what's, the, what's the latest and greatest configuration that we're working on, you know, especially important in software, obviously. All right, good to go on homework, and we'll do this lecture. Okay, very good. So basically you're going to hit three things tonight. These are them. We're going to talk about functional analysis up front. Uh, then I'll, I'll describe trade studies. The book doesn't do a very good job of describing trade studies, so a lot of what you're going to see in the lecture tonight isn't uh, exactly reflected in the, uh, in the textbook anywhere. Uh, and then we'll finish up with uh, a brief explanation of some test and evaluation stuff that kind of uh, grounds that in my experiences. All right, so with functional analysis, we've, we've kind of hit this before. We're talking about what things should do. So, so we're, we have been tasked to design a thing for a customer, and they, they describe what they want to us with a set of requirements. And so we read the requirements, and then from the requirements, we figure out what the functions are that that new thing is supposed to perform. So it's the what's and not to the how. So we're just going to, we just want to, in the end, and again, this, these things like this, functional analysis, requirements analysis, these are early conceptual design activities that take place to get your thoughts organized. It's to kind of narrow down the engineering trade space to something manageable uh, and to make sure that we're aligning that with what the customer really wants. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get out of this analysis work that we're talking about up front. All right. Uh, so so this, this functional analysis will be sort of the stepping off point for a lot of the follow-on engineering work that takes place. So it's something that definitely needs to occur early on and uh, needs to, there needs to be concurrence between the supplier and the customer on what the functions are that we're trying to achieve. All right. And then we'll break this down from a system level to a subsystem level, and we'll do a thing called allocation. And you'll see that word allocation used a few times, both for requirements and for functions. And what we're talking about there is when we come up with a set of subsystems that together are supposed to, you know, behave, are supposed to create the thing that we're delivering, we want to make sure that all of our functions in this case are being covered by one of those subsystems. Or maybe, maybe a function is covered by a couple of them. That's, that's not against the rules or anything. Uh, but but that, that allocation is what, what takes place to assign a function to a subsystem. You know, to be able to draw a line between all your functions and all your subsystems. And if you, you know, imagine, you know, connecting lines to where those functions occur within the subsystems. That's what allocation is all about. All right, so how do we do this functional analysis? How do we go about identifying the functions? Uh, what you will generally be given is a set of objectives uh, from the customer. So your, your, your customer is going to come to you and say, hey, I want this thing, and the reason I want this thing is because I want to increase aircraft survivability. So my objective in buying this new thing is to increase aircraft survivability, uh, which if I wanted to look at that in the inverse sense would mean to decrease the, suscept the, the susceptibility of the aircraft. Uh, or maybe I want to, uh, you know, increase flight safety uh, by reducing the mishap rate, all right? I apologize. I, I, I see now I, I throw too many military terms in there. Class A mishap is a bad one. That's one that uh, costs more than a million dollars or kills somebody. So, uh, you know, anyway, the, you know, increased flight, flight safety is my objective. Uh, I can accomplish that by reducing the aircraft mishap rate. So, so this is kind of what you'll get from the, from the customer, all right? And then what we're going to translate this into is a set of functions that we think our system needs to perform in order to meet those objectives. All right. So this is kind of what we do. This is what the customer hands to us. Uh, so at the end of the day, and when you're asked to identify functions, th this is 
this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be looking for. So it should be a verb plus an object. So I want the, my function is to detect threat from standoff. You know, absorb radar energy. So absorb radar. If I want a a low radar cross-section airplane, a stealth aircraft. You know, one, I'm sure that one of the functions that a stealth aircraft performs is it absorbs radar energy, which would then tie back into one of these, you know, increase aircraft survivability. So if I have an objective to increase aircraft survivability, my function is absorb radar energy, right? So when you're asked eventually, hey, give me five functions, the five functions should be expressed as a verb plus an object. So just a, a nice, short, succinct statement like that. All right? So notice in all this, we haven't limited the design trade space at all. All right? So notice how we're sticking to what we want done, you know, not how, not even how well, you know, we're just saying, just narrowing it down just to what we want done. All right, so a function by definition is a, uh, it's an action uh, or task uh, that the, uh, the system under design needs to perform, all right, uh, and and, and a, a function can also be, be defined as, you know, a process that converts uh, some inputs into an output using a set of mechanisms under a certain number of constraints. So, uh, you, you know, we've created this, uh, this little mnemonic here of ICOMS, which uh, just kind of just to help remember what each one of those are. So we have the the inputs uh, are brought are are used by the function to create the outputs. Uh, a number of mechanisms are used to do that and under a certain number of constraints. And we'll give you a few examples of uh, what that looks like. All right, so the function of this thing is to make a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, one of the greatest inventions ever. And actually, one of the best ones I ever had was in Japan. There was this little store that was outside the air base that we used to go to in Japan all the time. And that was, that was what they were famous for. So, you know, thousands of Americans flocked to this, this air base in Japan to go have a BLT out in town. It was, uh, it was a great stopping place. Anyway, so, uh, so our function uh, is to make a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. So remember ICOM, so I-C-O-M. So ICOM, our inputs, our, our ingredients, and the condiments, all right? The... Uh, uh, our constraints are is that you know, I have to be hungry to be able to want to do this. Uh, the mechanism by which we are going to make this happen is you know, certain tools, probably a knife and uh, you know, that sort of thing. And then the, the end output of the function is you, know, you have your sandwich. So at a very simplistic level, uh, that's how this, this process of visualizing functions takes place. All right? So if we, if we ground this in a little bit more uh, reality, we could say, okay, our, our function of our new system that, we, that we're looking for is to damage targets, all right? And so my input for that are going to be, you know, the, the weapon system, uh, it's gonna have a certain terminal angle when it impacts a target, it's gonna have a certain speed, it'll have some sort of, uh, a warhead and a fusing mechanism that's on there. So those are all the inputs that take place to be able to damage the target. Okay, the uh, my my mechanism by which the target is damaged could be any one of these warhead type things that are out there. Okay, so and these are all sort of current day th things that warheads are made out of. So you know tungsten cube fragments, expanding rods. A chemical charge is just an explosion, the old EMP, all right? And so, so, by, and so when we're sitting here with our team and we're, we're going through our requirements and trying to figure out what the functions are, we're, we're writing these things down and this is kind of a, this is generating sort of a brainstorming session together, all right? And then what we end up with with our list of mechanisms is the potential trade space. So, so these would be the things that we would do potential 
trade studies on to say, okay, well, we have we have four options. Which one do we want to pick? Uh, and so that that this could help us to identify uh, what trade studies we want to do. All right. So my my uh, uh, my constraints in this case are going to be. You know, the, sort of the characteristics of the thing, of the target that we're trying to damage here. So it could be, you know, the size, is it, you know, is it a building, is it a small truck, is it moving, is it stationary, do I know where it is, all those kind of things. And then, and then my output is going to be a damaged target, and the way we, the way we evaluate the damage to a target would be, uh, you know, some sort of a probability ratio or a lethal radius or something like that. All right, so that's... This, this is this sort of ICOM process to be able to think about our functions and uh, everything that goes into it. So a couple others. I, I can never avoid an airplane story in any given class, so uh, apologize up front for it. But uh, So if, we want, if our function is to launch an aircraft, uh, how would we use this mechanism to sort of you know, fill in the blanks that, that belong around there? So... Uh, on the aircraft carrier, uh, today we use uh, uh, steam catapults uh, to get shot off of the thing, and it, uh, it imparts uh, a, a very powerful force, but it's actually gradually uh, delivered to the end. So it's not one big, you know, it's not a hammer that, that knocks a thing off. It sort of, uh, you know, increases with force as the airplane's traveling down the launch area uh, in those sort of two and a half seconds that you have to, to do that. So today we use steam catapults. They're actually working on an electromagnetic version of that now uh, that they're hoping to put on the, the next aircraft carrier that we build. Uh, or you could do this with uh, some sort of hydraulic system. So what would the inputs to that be? Well, you have to know the weight of the aircraft because that's, that's how it figures out how hard it needs to, to drag it down the, uh, down the input, down the, uh, down the, the, the pointy end of the ship. Uh, and so you calculate your own weight of your aircraft because you know that based on how much fuel you're carrying and what, what you got hanging on the outside of the airplane. And, and then you tell somebody that over the radio. And then a guy comes out with a little board and he shows it to you and it says, you know, 52,000. And then yet you go, yep, that's 52,000. That's good. And then he carries it back. And then that's what they dial into the little launcho meter on the, uh, on the aircraft carrier to make sure you get the right amount. So, uh, you need to know how much thrust the aircraft's producing, uh, how much wind. The, the aircraft carrier actually steers itself into the wind because it has to generate uh, 30 miles an hour of wind over the deck to be able to launch an airplane. Otherwise, you don't, you don't get going enough before you get to the end. Uh, so, so it has to create this wind speed, and you have to have a ready signal and a launch command to be able to uh, go ahead and initiate the launch. So the constraints are obviously you know, the weight of the aircraft, uh, the jet blast strength, uh, because the, the the deck of the aircraft carrier is really crowded, so you have these other airplanes that are all kind of lined up waiting to go. So, so they have this huge, you know, plate of steel that that rises up from the carrier deck, so that this guy's not blowtorching the airplane that's right behind him. And so that that jet blast deflector, deflector has to be designed correctly to be able to handle all the the heat uh, that's generated by, uh, by, the, by the engines of the airplane and stuff. So, so all these go into be constraint, design constraints to our launch system uh, on, the, uh, on the aircraft carrier. And then the output of that is some kinetic energy that's imparted to the, uh, the, to the aircraft uh, that has to be sufficient for it to, uh, get to get to flying speed before it reaches the end. All right. One more, I won't bore you with another one. You get the idea at this point, but you know, same kind of thing. If we're functions to recover the aircraft, uh, we, we go through our inputs, our mechanisms identify uh, the trade space that we have. So um, in this particular case, you could, kinda, you could consider that the tail hook and the arresting wires together form a system of systems. So we had a... You know, there was a question on that in the homework, too, about, you know, looking at system of systems. And the important thing to remember with a system of systems is that 
each system within the greater system has some purpose on its own. It doesn't need everything else to accomplish itself so, or its intended purpose. So in this case, the tail hook is its, its own standalone system that also has its own function because at regular airfields, they have cables stretched across the runway so that you can use those in case your brakes don't work and that sort of thing. So there, it's not just an aircraft carrier thing. They have them other, other places too. So, and then the arresting wire system is definitely its own entire, uh, entire system in and of itself that you know, has to be able to retract itself back after recovering an airplane and uh, all that kind of good stuff. All right, so let's see. If we were going to try and do this ourselves, let me see if I can uh, make this work the way I had intended. All right, almost. Okay, so our inputs, like, so if this is our system, this is our little UAV with its little launcher system, and our function is to launch the UAV, uh, what do we think some of the inputs to that would be? All right, anybody, inputs to launch our UAV, yes. Weight of the UAV. Weight of the UAV. So would that be a would that be an input or would that be a constraint? Are there different UAVs being launched that you would have to like do like you did on a plane where you have to give it a different amount of kick? You would you possibly, yeah. So so in this case, the uh, though the w w weight is really a constraint, not an input, right? Because the because think about the, this function has to be performed under certain constraints. So under one of those constraints under which it has to be performed is, you know, a, a UAV of a given weight. So, sir. So then would the input be the launch thrust required? Yeah. So here's what, uh, here's my little box. Come here, there you. I didn't do it. There we go. So yeah, so the I think you were talking about the force that has to it. So it's, yeah, some force has to be imparted upon the to, to be able to get the launch to work. All right. Did you have something? I was going to say like wind and other. Uh, wind, yeah. So so again. Uh, I think the, to me, the, the wind would be uh, a constraint in this case because the, uh, you know, un unlike the aircraft carrier example where it had to create wind, in this case, the wind becomes a constraint because we have to know where it is to be able to point it in the right direction so we don't, like, launch it with a tailwind and it, then it crashes off the end of the catapult. Sir. Sure. Kind of look at it as a function. Would you say then that the constraints are like your input variables and your um, the input that you gave us is the solved for uh, parts of that equation? Like the force yes. required is yes. equal to the wind and the mass and all that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So so the force is going to be sort of a variable that depends on these other things that are going on, all these other constraints that are going on. So. So constraints could be viewed as things that I have to handle, you know, in, in, in the performance of this function, uh, that I have to be able to deal with and to be able to perform the function. All right? So remember that the, the inputs are converted by the, the function into an output. All right, so the force is converted by the launcher into a launched UAV in this case, kind of what I'm trying to get at. All right, so for constraints, uh, what I had come up with were these guys. So we have the, 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 uh, the size of the UAV, the weight of the UAV, and the, uh, and the wind direction. All right, and then the mechanisms that are used in this case to uh, to launch the UAV, we have we have either the catapult uh, that we have pictured here, uh, or uh, the 
their, the drop release. And what I mean by that is if you, if you started the motor on the UAV and then hoisted it up a certain distance, eventually you could just drop it and it would get enough speed to where it could fly out before it hit the ground. So uh, that was another thing they were looking at. These guys were looking at doing this with uh, this big quadcopter kind of thing that would basically lift the UAV, that did start the engine of the UAV, the quadcopter would hoist it up about 100 feet and then it hit a button and it would let it go and it would kind of it would look like it was just going to crash into the ground but then it would generate enough speed to be able to fly out before it would uh before it hit the ground and uh and they covered it with gopro cameras so they filmed the whole thing and everything which was doing this and uh it worked pretty well so the idea was to reduce the logistical footprint for for the folks using it so because the quadcopter, you could put everything you needed into the back of a regular pickup truck and then be able to launch it instead of having to pull this big trailer around with you. So, anyway, and then eventually you get outputs, which would be, you know, you could express them in either like a time to launch or a time to controlled flight. So, the, you know, the UAV goes off and it kind of, you know, bounces around a little bit and eventually, you know, it, it stabilizes into a controlled flight, so. All right, you end up with that. Okay, so if you're asked just for the function, the function is launch UAV. So if you're, if you're tasked with creating a, a UAV system that, you know, that, that's what you're, the thing you're trying to provide. One of your subsystems is going to probably be this launch device and its function that it has to, has to perform is launch UAV. And when you, if you have a number of subsystems, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that in a little bit. All right. So once you've created all these lists of functions uh, and you've thought through all this, uh, the, the next logical thing to do, and I'm sure a lot of you have done this for your, for your projects you've been working on, is you create this thing called a functional flow block diagram. Uh, the, sometimes they're just called a functional block diagram as well. The flow piece of that is supposed to describe the notion of time, right? So a functional flow block diagram would show some sort of a sequence. So in this example, uh, our top level function is to build a new house. And below that, we've, we've come up with some sub-functions that need to take place. So you've got to plan it, finance it, build it, and occupy it. Uh, and then they further break down the construction part of it here. So, so the, the flow part of this is supposed to imply that this is a sequential operation. So this would happen before number two, number two happens before number three, et cetera. It doesn't define how much time goes by or anything. It just, just that, that some time elapses before you get to the, the second one. Uh, now, sometimes things happen in parallel. So, you know, you use your imagination to come up with whatever the best way is to display that. All right. So functions that happen in parallel in a functional flow block diagram end up getting, you know, stacked on top of each other. So this would, in, this would infer that you could install roofing, wiring, and plumbing all at the same time. All right, those would all be going on at once. All right. And then while, while any of these are going on, you could be landscaping the property outside. All right, so that's kind of a way to get the, the functions organized and display them in a block diagram. We'll go through a couple of different ways. There's no set way that you have to do any of this stuff. Uh, it's really up to, you know, use your imagination, uh, you know, tap into that left brain artistic part of you and uh, figure out what the best way is to get the information across. All right? But all this would happen after you've had your list of functions. So come up with your list of functions and then figure out how they plug into some sort of a logical depiction. All right. So if you had this as just a, a computer processor, uh, you know, a, and you want to do a functional block diagram. Now we've, now we're just calling it a functional block diagram so there's no inference about time in this thing. We don't know when one thing happens in relation to another one, but, but what we are now depicting is that there's this, some, there's an interface between these, uh, and, and they, and it travels in both directions. So it's sending and receiving in all cases. So, 
Um, you could, you can add additional information to these too sometimes. So you could put, you could write over these. I've seen ones where you write uh, on the on the line. What is it that goes over there? Is it data? Is it power? Uh, you know, what is it that's traveling over there? All right. Uh, all ways of depicting functions. So it's all just what is happening, uh, not necessarily how, right? All right, there's a way. Uh, this is another sort of functional hierarchy type of uh, diagram. Uh, so th this thing was the, this digital integrated onboard entertainment system. That was my project for my master's. Uh, and so it was supposed to be like, you know, a fancy car entertainment system that did, you know, played movies and music and all this kind of stuff all at once. So, uh, so it was called DOS. And so these were all at a very top level. These were, it was supposed to show all the different functions that this would do. Um, so we talked a little bit at the, at the beginning about modeling, right? This was, so, so this, I use this modeling software that's called Enterprise Architect that was a way, you know, that was kind of a handy way of, uh, it, it was sort of one-stop shopping for requirements analysis, functional analysis. So you kind of wrote down what all your requirements were, what all your functions were. You could diagram them. You could you could maintain uh, uh, traceability to all your requirements to make sure that you hadn't orphaned one of them by by leaving them out or that sort of thing. All right. So it, it, that was a hierarchy level. If you dug deeper into one of those. Then you could depict like, okay, here's the here's the video option for this. So, you know, the, the once you, dis, you know, select the video option, uh, the your available options are you know your play, stop, rewind, fast forward stuff, uh, and then you're playing the movie, and then if you if you selected any one of these, it kind of depicts what would go on. So, just another way to show. Uh, how, how functions are, are, you know, keeping track of them, where they belong in the system, uh, and that sort of thing. All right? So we come to class exercise number one. So get yourself into, into little groups. What I'd like you to do is kind of this is your system. So, you know, our familiar UAV system, uh, I've kind of shown it you know, the different components of it. So we have the aircraft, the launcher, the recovery. This is supposed to show the ground station where you process, you know, look at the pictures that it's sending down. This would be the payload. So, uh, so get yourself together uh, as a group, as a couple groups, and write down 10 functions for our UAV system here. And then we'll, uh, we'll share our thoughts on functions when we're done with that. So, so function. We are missing. It. And then once you have a couple of functions written down, then you know start putting them into some sort of a, a block diagram or functional flow block diagram, either one.
Hey, Anu, if I want to write on the whiteboard, can you film it? Okay, excellent. We'll be doing that shortly. So UAVs can have a whole myriad of jobs once they get airborne. Let's just narrow this one down to taking pictures. So this one collects imagery. Make keep it simple. Oh, 
control flight. Control flight. Yeah, but you uh, should be in parallel. <laughs> No, you want to be on the man. Okay, yeah. But it would be like the parallel ship. Yeah. And then be like, okay, this is what we should So transition to. All right, folks, let's start sharing some ideas here. So we'll kind of, uh, I'll take input from you guys, try and translate it up onto a whiteboard and see if we can, uh, you know, come, come up with sort of an agreed set here. So, so I think it's, it's probably easy if, if we start like the, like the build the house example. So from a very top level, can we come up with, you know, the four or five top level functions that our, that our system needs to perform? So what, do, what, give me one of these top level type functions. Uh, recover aircraft. Recover aircraft, okay, definitely. So we'll put topic. that one, <laughs> right we'll put that one over here. Yeah, I just kind of like looked at it. So recover. I was like trying to use the equations, what the fuck is going on? Okay, anyone else? What's another top level one? Easy one. Surveillance. Okay. Okay, it's kind of its uh, main mission. So, uh, what's another, you guys, top level, what's one that belongs up on top? From these guys. Collect um, images. All right, pictures. we'll put that one under perform surveillance header at some point. So, what's another sort of more top level one? Uh, process data. Process data. Yep. Okay. 
process data, put that over here. Okay, another top level one. Launch. Launch, yep, absolutely. Launch aircraft. And then the other one I'd say would be like like prepare the aircraft or, or something like that. Something that's happening over here, you know. So we could call that prepare, ready, something like that. And you'll see that, you know, prepare aircraft, you know, you could argue, is, is that something that the system does or is it something that we do to the system? And, and so, and it's a little bit of both, right? So, but, but what we're trying to get out of having a function of prepare aircraft is, is trying to, you know, we're going to use that as a forcing function to go through the design requirements that it clearly has to be able to be preparable, you know, it needs to stow away in this box and be able to get out of there and, and get together. And, and, and we know that underneath that, we're going to definitely be able to come up with some nice clear functions that definitely belong to the aircraft. So, so in a way, I'm kind of cheating a little bit by saying prepare aircraft is a function that the system performs, but I'm going to use that as a header to get to there. All right. All right, so let's see, under, who had launch aircraft? You guys did, right? So under, what is a, what are some of the, do, 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 do you have anything in and around there in terms of functions about launching the aircraft? Uh, well, we said that you have to determine the flight conditions. Okay, all right, yep. So determine flight conditions because you'd need that to be able to kind of, you know, orient the thing into the wind, uh, you know, do some sort of a go no go decision whether you should even launch at all, uh, you know that sort of thing. So, so yep, determine conditions. So, but by making that a uh, a function of our system, what we're saying is that our system is going to determine the conditions. So, that we by by saying by by agreeing that that's a function of our system, we're also committing to you know, having some sort of a wind meter and a thermometer and, uh, you know, all this other stuff that goes along with that. So, so we would want that to be able to, we would want traceability from that function to a requirement. If we didn't have a requirement to, to be able to know that stuff, when we wouldn't want to have that as a function because the customer doesn't want to buy a thermometer from us because they've already got one, you know, or something like that. Okay. Uh, who had performed surveillance? Uh, anything else, or, you know, mission-oriented, any other mission-oriented type functions that you had? Take photographs. Okay. Yep. Anything else around that? Process data and transmit data. Transmit data, yep. Yeah. And then process data. Uh, I would, so we have process data here, but you could put process data underneath this part of our, our block diagram. Uh, perhaps it, maybe there's some processing that needs to take place up on the airplane to ready it to come down to the ground or so, you know, put it in the right format or something like that. So, so yeah, I could see putting process data in a couple of different places. All right. Who had uh, recover the uh, aircraft? Anything, any other functions that are kind of in and around that at all? They're sort of... Control aircraft. Control the aircraft, yep. Yeah. Definitely. You know, so you have to control the aircraft to be able to kind of steer it back to its uh, recovery point, right? So, yep, recover aircraft, you could put underneath that. Control aircraft belongs in there. Uh, any other things? Any other things? So, how about under process data? Anything else there? You could have things like maybe disseminate data. If you got to be able to send it off someplace, you could have um, uh, display data could be under process data. So. With that, any other functions that we haven't really covered? Anyone have any other, any neat ones that they uh, they came up with? Yeah. Determine attitude. 
Determined attitude, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, another one that we don't have up here is, uh, is sort of, uh, you know, would need one for fly around, you know, uh, proceed to target area of interest or, or, you know, some sort of another function that captures that. And that would be a great one to put underneath there, you know, determine attitude because for it to, for it to control itself, it needs to know, you know, where it is in, in time and space, right? So, uh, yeah, that could be another good one would add under there. Any others? Survival mood. Sorry, say again? Uh, like emergency survival mood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, let's put, um, so let's say launch is going to be one of our top ones. Prepare, recover, and process. So we'll say those are our top level ones, and then we need another one that's a top level one that says, uh, um, Flight, yeah. Uh, maintain flight. And so we had under there attitude, attitude with an I. Emergency recovery. Yep. Good one. Any other any other functions that we liked? Yeah. Received commands. Received commands. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's see. We could we could bucket that one under under here. Receive. All right. Any others, sir? Load the payload. Load the payload. Yeah. So we can put that up here. Yeah. Other ones that I'd put under here too is something like maybe uh, accept fuel. Except fuel. Um, maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, perform health checks could be another function that it needs to perform on the ground. You know, you want it to you want it to kind of be able to run through the motions on the ground before launching it. All right. Yes. I just have a question, actually. With yeah. except fuel, is that a common way to say, like, fuel the? There. Yeah. So, so what you're kind of some of these functions you're kind of beginning with the end in mind, you know. So you're you, so you're saying, well, I I gotta have a way to fuel it somehow. So it's gotta have a fuel tank. It's gotta have a way to be able to, you know, get the fuel from my storage container into the thing. So it's a way to drive. A, a, a design decision of some sort that you know you're going to have to go through, you know. So I'm going to have to figure out where to put the fuel tank and where to put the fuel cap on the outside, you know. So, so some of this, yeah, some of this is like, I, I know where I need to get, so give me a, give me a function that kind of takes me there. You know? Also, if you said something like uh, fuel, like it, it is fueled or something, wouldn't that kind of imply that fueling is part of the system? It could be, yeah. And you would have to provide yeah. like the fueling equipment, so just the fuel tank. Yeah, it could be, yep. Yeah, if that, if that was one of your requirements. Again, you know, you'd have to have some sort of a way to trace back to, for every one of your functions, you should say, why, why do you think you need that function? Well, because I have this requirement here that says so. So at some point, there needs to be this reconciling between the functions and the requirements to make sure that you're not over-designing things. All right. All right, so we get the, I think we get the, get the picture on how to do these. So you'll have a question on the midterm. It'll say, here's a, here's a given system. 
you know, name five functions or something like that. And that's what I'm looking for. Just the word, just the, like these little like two or three word sort of phrases is, uh, is what we're looking for on those. All right, good. Any questions on that? Understand what we're talking about when we say functions? Okay. All right, good. Now we, and I already kind of hit this, but the allocation part then, once you'd have all these set up, you would want to make sure that you have those properly allocated or assigned to the appropriate subsystem. So in this, if you had these, these could be notionally what your subsystems would be. Within this, you'd want to allocate functions just like you allocate requirements to the different subsystems and then they'd uh, make sure you keep everything organized and well captured. All right, folks, you've made it to the end of functions. Um, I'm going to keep going. I uh, just want to try and get as much of the class in before anybody needs to leave. So we're going to keep cranking through this. So next section of the class here is about trade studies. Uh, and what are they? So a trade study is, once again, a process, right? Systems engineering is all about the process. So a trade study is a process that's used to make design decisions between, you know, you have, you have four different candidates, you want to know which one is the best one to choose. All right, so uh, if you are designing an antenna and uh, you, can, you kind of have the choice in the engineering world to have really good gain or really good power handling, but you can never have both of those at the same time baked into the same cake. So if one antenna, one design approach has better gain performance uh, than, than another, that would be uh, a trade study. You know, if one has better thermal characteristics, meaning it can, it, it, it can handle getting hot, then it's going to have better power handling. So can I, can I sacrifice some gain in favor of power handling? Or can I, is, is the customer maybe not that interested in power handling? I don't, I don't need to transmit a really powerful signal, but I want to make sure it gets as far as possible. So maybe I come down with my power and go up on my gain, you know? So those are, those would be two potential things that you could trade against each other in, uh, in an engineering environment, right? All right, so, so for us, a trade study is going to mean that we're comparing a couple different alternatives uh, that are within our, our system under design uh, to come up with the best approach, all right? And, and what we want to try to do by doing this is come up with an objective foundation for, for making that decision. We want to be able to explain to the customer why we made the decision we did. What, what, what was our, you know, show me your math, you know, what went into it. Not just because it felt right or, you know, it looked better, uh, that sort of thing. So we're going to try and... We're going to try and take things that are normally, that could be subjective decisions, and we're going to try to objectify them as much as possible. All right. Okay, so a uh, couple ways you know that you're going about doing a trade study correctly. Uh, first of all, you want to make it its own organized, distinct process uh, that's separate from uh, the rest of the design process that's going on. So in other words, you want to make a conscious decision to say, we're going to do a trade study. These are the things that we're considering. Uh, and, and, you know, here's how much time we have. Here's how much money we want to spend on doing this, whatever. We want to, we want to make it its own separate entity. All right. So the, the trade study should be exhausted, meaning we, we shouldn't leave anything on the table. Because right? we don't want to end up at the end of the day explaining to the customer, hey, we chose this and this was the rigorous system you know, process that we followed to come to this decision. And they go, yeah, but you forgot to consider this. And we're like, oh, yeah. So, so you want to make sure that you don't leave anything out. You know? All viable uh, options should be on the table. All right? We already hit this one. We want to make them uh, as quantitative as possible. Uh, at the end of the day. So it's an objective decision. All right, so 
the, uh, a lot of times the alternatives you're going to consider in a trade study uh, have, uh, have impacts on different aspects of the design. So, uh, you know, one, one alternative could be great for maintainability of the system, but it might not be the, all that great for the performance of the system. You know, so, so when you're doing these trade studies, you need to kind of make sure that, you're, that you've considered uh, all of the different characteristics of the system under design, the maintainability, uh, the reliability, the, uh, the, the, just the, the, the straight out performance of the system. Uh, so it needs to kind of try and encompass all those different considerations that go into making one thing better than another. All right. And, and we also, we want to make sure we document the, the process that we went through, what were the different alternatives that we considered, and how we came up with the, uh, the answer. Okay. Keep that all documented so that when we uh, go outside and get run over by the beer truck, someone else can come and pick up our work and understand what we did and why. All right. So uh, trade studies could be kind of divided into three different sort of uh, categories. Uh, and uh, so you will do you know, this would be like this, the simplest kind would be just a, a quick mental trade study that's performed by somebody that, that has a qualification to do that. So there's some sort of a subject matter expert in the area that's being considered. Uh, and they could go through their own uh, decision making process. That could be considered uh, a trade study at a very informal level. All right. The next notch up from that would be uh, an informal one. An informal one could be something where uh, the, out, the, the, the outcome of the trade study is important to the success of the design, but it's not necessarily something that you're going to have to brief to the customer. You know, it's for your own sort of internal use uh, of, your, of your, your company or your design team uh, to be able to do. So we still want it documented, uh, but it's not going to be as rigorous as uh, you know, what we'd call a formal trade study. So in the formal trade study, uh, that's something that you're going to, uh, you're, not, you're, you're not only going to go through the internal documentation, but you're going to prepare it for presentation to the customer to be able to explain your methodology uh, and how you came up with the uh, recommendation that you did. All right. Uh, a lot of times customers will specifically ask you to do trade studies. Uh, in fact, it's quite common on many of the programs I've worked on uh, the customer, you know, they're not sure what they want exactly up front. And so your task is to do a trade study as the, at the beginning of your program. And then you're tasked with briefing them on the results of the trade study before they authorize you to proceed with, uh, with the rest of the program. All right. You know, so they can be very, uh, you know, very well defined and, and very rigorous. Okay, so this is kind of like your, your, your V diagram of doing a trade study, all right? Uh, so these are kind of the steps we're going to go through. We'll have a slide for each one of these as we go through these, but we're going to march through. We're going to determine what the objectives are. What are we trying to get out of the trade study? Uh, we're going to name our, what are the candidates that we're going to compare against each other? What are the criteria by which we are going to compare them? Uh, we will then... Uh, figure out some sort of a scoring system within those criteria to, so that we can, uh, you, you know, say that one is better than the other. Uh, we'll evaluate those, apply weights and values. That comes up with a final score, and then we'll do that sensitivity analysis. You know, are there any of these scores that we've come up with that, boy, if I just changed one of my assumptions a little bit, it would have completely changed the outcome of the thing. All right. So this is sort of our process that we're going to go through, uh, and then here's kind of dig into a little bit more detail on each one of those. All right. So at, at the at the outset of this uh, adventure, then the uh, we need to uh, define why the trade study is needed, uh, because these you know just like anything else in the engineering world, this is going to cost money. Because time is money, and so we are, we are going to dedicate resources to thinking about this, then that's, that's the same as spending money on it. So 
Uh, so we want to make sure that we know why we need to do this. Uh, we'd like to have that agreed to by our customer. Uh, and then uh, we'll, any kind of bounding that needs to happen will happen up in this planning phase in terms of, uh, you know, we want to really kind of define the engineering trade space within which we're trying to operate, all right, so that we kind of bound, that, that will automatically exclude some, of, some potential candidates from consideration so that you don't spend too much time on things that were, you know, didn't apply or were kind of nonsense, all right. So. Uh, we also need to understand what's important to the customer. You know, is, is, are, are, we, are we doing this trade study because we're trying to get improved performance? Are we doing it because we're trying to reduce cost? There's all kinds of reasons for having to do this. We need to understand what, what the reason is that, that this particular trade study needs to be done. What are we trying to get out of doing this? All right, and then use experience. This is very important. This, you know, the, it's important to go on the hunt for people that really have uh, uh, expertise in the area in which you're you're doing this consideration. So, you know, if you're trying to pick, you know, one optical design over another to make this fancy camera, then you know you need an optical engineer involved. You know, so uh, so you got to make sure that you have the right experienced people to be able to participate in the trade study. All right, uh, then we need to start at the, at the outset, figure out what are our alternatives, um, you know, what, uh, and, and ways to go, ways to come up with what our alternatives are could be to look at the way things are done today and how, how could we, you know, how is this task being done today with today's technology and, you know, so we can use that as a way to say, okay, if we made a little bit of improvement on this, this could be a good way to do it. You know, it, g it, gives, you, it gives you a sense for what options th are available that are, that are within striking distance of being ready for you, you know, almost like a little feasibility study, all right? So figure out what the alternatives are, uh, you know, we th there should be requirements that we're that we are being held to. So the, the the requirements drive all those shall statements drive everything that you're doing in the engineering world. So we but but invariably there are desires. You know there are wants to do something that they didn't the customer didn't want to write it down as a requirement because they didn't want to drive a bunch of cost into it. But they know we know that they want that. And so you know as we're coming up with our alternatives. We should be considering the wants uh, just in case there's a thing that has what you call fallout performance, you know, kind of, I, I, I can give you that for free because it came with this design alternative that I, that I chose. So if there are wants, we should be aware of them and then weigh them into our decision making at this stage. All right. Generally, you want to come up with Four to seven, I think seven's high. I'd, you know, definitely kind of keep that down toward the, uh, uh, you don't want too many alternatives. Um, but there again, you don't want too few either. You know, you don't kind of, if, if, if your choices are one of two, then it's not really a trade study anymore. So trade studies are things that, that will take, you know, at least four type of alternatives and help you come up with a good answer uh, for which one. All right. All right. So then you come up with the criteria. You come up with the criteria by considering considering the requirements. What are the most important criteria? You know, a customer will never list the requirements in their their uh, order of which ones are their favorite. Uh, so, but but they're but you know they're in there. Uh, and so generally by by reading all the documentation that comes, you know, that describes the operational scenarios and that sort of thing, you're going you're gonna to get a sense of which are the most important requirements to, to the customer. You know, is it range? Is it speed? Is it weight? Is it volume? You know, uh, all those are criteria. So, th so you're going to come up with those uh, that are, that are going to be, that are going to resonate to the design team or the customer. Uh, 
a good place to start are your technical performance measures. If there's a list of those, those are generally associated with your most important requirements. Uh, and then uh, and then you need to agree to this list. Again, it needs to be not an infinite list, uh, not a terribly short list, and not a terribly long list. So again, kind of in the four to seven criteria kind of range is uh, is what you're shooting for. All right. Once you've selected the criteria, you need to come up with a way to 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 score uh, each of your alternatives for those criteria, right? So, so if your criteria is, you know, weight, uh, you know, in in this case, what they're showing, this is what they call these utility functions. So it's ways of converting a criteria, in this case, weight, into a score. In this case, it goes some score that goes from zero to ten. So what this is telling me is that they want the thing to be really light. So the lighter it gets, the higher my score gets. And so it's a way to, to convert your your weight into a score that you can then use to do a side by side evaluation of multiple candidates, right? So so these are what they call utility functions. Uh, the, they're they're great ways to convert performance into score. Uh, this analytical hierarchy process is a it's a way of, of making a score out of a subjective criteria. So if, you're, if your criteria is, you know, it has to look good, right, then how do you, how do you score looking good, you know? Well, this analytical hierarchy process is kind of a way to do that, and it, it's, it's too complicated for this class, but it's basically a way of, of uh, you could take poll results, uh, uh, you know, do you prefer, uh, and, and then, um, or you could ask a, a, a representative group of people, you know, do you like, it's almost like going to the eye doctor, is A better than B, you know, Was, is B better than C, is C better than A, and you kind of go through this interview process, you collect the, the inputs from this, and uh, you go through this, the rest of this analytical hierarchy process thing, and it allows you to sort of start associating scores with subjective things. All right? So there are ways to get there. They take a lot of work and a lot of time. Um, I participated in one when I was working at the Pentagon as a major one time about this uh, uh, reconnaissance system that they wanted, and they kind of gave, they had a, a room full of us in a room, and they asked, you know, is, is this particular criteria more important to you than this one? And they kind of went through this whole process, and you had a little kind of like secret voting machine that you were inputting your answers into, and it spat out a, a score at the end of the day. So there are ways to convert, uh, but they're time-consuming and uh, not very engineering-ish. All right, so that's how we, we want to get the, convert everything into a score. Uh, so, so how do we know whether we chose good criteria or not? Okay, so so your criteria, this this is a good way to kind of go through to say, okay, are my my six criteria that I chose to evaluate are are they good ones or not? And so reliability would mean that it is is it a criteria that I can measure the same way every time? You know, so if if my my criteria could be something like a my uh, I, I'm designing a protection circuit for a radio, and so if if the uh, if I, if the out the output power is needs to be reduced to one watt, you know, so I can easily so so output power one watt or less that could be my criteria, and, and that's a good one because I can I can reliably measure that, and I know that I'm going to be able to measure output power accurately and with repeatability. Okay, so that's what we mean by a reliable criteria. Consistently yields the same results every time I go back and look at it. All right. So validity is when I, when I evaluate that criteria, uh, am, am I actually getting uh, 
valid information out of it? Am I really getting the information out of it that I think I'm getting out of it? Uh, so, uh, because we don't want to ever, you know, blindly take a measurement and say, you know, I, I input this into the formula, it spat out this number, therefore that number must be the right number, right? You don't do that in any of your classes. You know, you always kind of have a sense for what the number should look like before you go through the, one, of, one of those big, you know, two-page long formulas that you aeronautical engineers like to use. So you, you have to have a sense of what the, what the output should look like to make sure that you're in the right ballpark, to be able to trust that your output is reliable, right? So that's, that's the, validity, uh, the validity aspect of your criteria. All right, and then the sensitivity, we've talked about that before, the same kind of thing, the sensitivity analysis. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that the inputs are correct. We want to make sure that we haven't neglected anything, that we haven't overlooked a criteria that we should be using. All right, and your sensitivity analysis, you know, objectively, the way you do the sensitivity analysis is you try inputting a, a false value, you know. So, so when, when you looked at this criteria, any given criteria for your trade study, and uh, it, it w gave you a certain score when we, uh, when we applied the score. So if you, uh, you know, purposely give it a wrong score, does you, do you still come out with the same answer? Or does your trade study now, have, has the, have the results of your trade study changed by you tweaking the numbers, okay? So that, that's kind of what you're going through. You're, you're going through this sensitivity analysis to make sure that uh, you weren't just a, just a little bit left or right of center and all of a sudden it gives the trade study outcome gives you a different answer, all right? So you're kind of monkeying with the numbers a little bit to make sure that you weren't really close to getting a completely different answer. That's what the sensitivity analysis is to do. So, question on that. Mm -hmm. um, so, how do you actually go about documenting all of this? Is it something that you would kind of like write up in uh, just a, a doc, like a typed written word document, or something you do in like a spreadsheet, or write code, or something? How would how do you document all? <laughs> Typically, what I see is it's a PowerPoint presentation. You know, so it kind of leads leads you through the whole process you went through. These are the criteria, this is how we came up with them. This is how I performed my sensitivity analysis. You know. So you, you, you're just kind of documenting results like that. Another way you could do is, like you said, a Word document. And we use that a lot uh, it, it, it work. We, we call them SCRs, a System Engineering Report. And that's kind of a generic report that explains your work, of how you got to something. So. Oh, what about those, I forget what they're called, but those house diagrams, you know, with the triangle on top and then could, could that be useful in this sort of situation? Is that common for trade studies or? I'm sure I'm following you. Um, following. Oh, geez. Health of, house of quality. Oh, house of quality? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't, I, they, they, they talk about that in the textbook. I have no experience using a house of quality. I've used one and I thought I found it really helpful. It's, okay. a, it's a good way to visualize all of this. Okay. Yeah. 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 Where where'd you learn about the house of quality? A freshman they, they, projects. Here in some class that you took here at school? Freshman projects. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I I I I'd never heard of that until I read it in the textbook for this class. So I, I'm sorry, I just don't have any experience with it. Okay, this is the very last step of the trade study. This is in, you know, uh, weight your scores. So when you, by, by weighting, and we'll, I'll show you an example for this in just a minute. But, uh, but you know, so, some of your criteria are going to be more important than others, you know. And so the weighting is making sure that the scores for the most important thing get considered more than a score for something that's not as important. All right. So that's, that's it's, it's your way of making sure that the most important criteria uh, get the most consideration when you, to determine the outcome of the trade study. All right, so we'll step through a, uh, a quick example. <laughs> it's a military example. How about that? You know. <laughs> uh, so the example trade study we're going to do 
is uh, the Marine Corps is in search of a, uh, a computer system to help them aim mortars, all right? Uh, the mortar is called an indirect fire system because you don't aim it at the target and pull the trigger. You loft everything and uh, uh, by, by magic it ends up falling on top of the target. Horribly inaccurate weapons. Uh, it's in, in F-18 would do, uh, uh, would do control for fire that call it. So we'd kind of orbit overhead. It's a great job. You kind of orbiting overhead, you know, you're all relaxed up there in the cockpit looking down at the guys that are in the 120 degree desert running around and they'd, uh, you could, um, uh, in the, the, the kids that you talk to on the radio were always like the really young kids that were doing their first mission and so you'd call them up on the radio, you know, and uh, say, hey, I'm, I'm ready for your fire mission, go ahead, and they'd, they'd come back, they're like, Sir, ready for the fire mission? You can hear all the noise in the background every time they'd key the mic, and they'd read you a series of, uh, you know, you'd, you'd had this kind of pre-formatted script that you'd go through to be able to tell them where the target was that you were trying to get them to hit, and uh, they'd shoot the thing. These things take forever from the time they shoot, they fire until they hit the ground. It's like, you know, a minute and a half, which is like an eternity and that sort of thing. And... Uh, and you'd be, you'd be staring at the target, staring, waiting to see the explosion, and all of a sudden in the corner of your eye, you'd see it way over the, you know, like, like miles off target they could be. You know, uh, so that's why all those military ranges are so big out there in the desert. You know? uh, so anyway, this little, uh, little example of a um, trade study involves this. So they need something, uh, a computer system that they can take out into the field with them and, uh, you know, instead of using the, uh, the abacus and the Ouija board, they would actually be able to input numbers into a computer and it would tell them how to aim their uh, mortar system to be able to uh, drop the round on target. So we're after a nice, compact, sturdy, uh, you know, uh, field computer of some sort. So quick scan of the internet uh, comes up with, uh, you know, four possible little handheld things. So, uh, so here we go. Here's one of them. Uh, and uh, it, you can look up the, like, the spec sheet for these things, and it gives you an idea of what criteria to use, right? So, so this gives you your list of possible criteria. Uh, so, you know, we could go through here and go, okay, display size, that could be a criteria. Uh, memory capacity, 16 whole megabytes. So, uh, you know, you can tell where this thing came from. This has been around for a while. Uh, dimensions, weight could be a criteria. Uh, so operating environment, this says full operating environment, mill standard 810 Echo. So, it, uh, you know, it's a military grade, ruggedized little hand computer. You know, operating temperature, cost, 1789, you know, so, so all of these give you, by looking up the spec sheet for the thing, it tells you what the possible criteria are. Yeah, I don't know how old this is. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and then you go, so you pull up the spec sheet for each one of these things, and you go through the same drill, you find, gives you all their criteria, and at the end of the day, you select which criteria you want to use for your trade study. All right. So what's going to be what's going to be important? You know. I, and so so these are these are all my possible criteria that I could use that I've because because this is the data that I've found. Sometimes that'll drive your criteria. Is what data can I find on this thing to be able to make a decision? Uh, and now you're going to kind of try and figure out. Well, I want these things to be of interest to my customer. You know. So they they want a fast answer. Uh, they want the thing to be able to last for quite a while uh, without having to plug it in and recharge it. So, you know, you're coming up with criteria that you know are going to be of significance to, to your customer and that you can get uh, objective answers for. Uh, you want reliable objective answers. So, uh, you know, you want, you want to make sure that when you're talking about battery life, you're you're measuring that in some reliable way across the board so that it's, you're comparing apples to apples, that sort of thing. All right? So this is, at, at the end of the day, I hope you can see that okay. So I have said, you know, that, uh, so, so here's my, my weighting is going to be, this is going to tell me which ones I think are the most important. So, so we've assigned a 30% weight to 
to wait. Uh, and uh, so we say, so we're saying there that the customer wants the thing, the, more than anything, they want it to be light so that they can carry it around. Actually quite common for, uh, for, for the Marines because it all has to go in a backpack and some guys got to, or gals got to carry it around. So, so weight is, you know, truthfully, it's, it's really is a very important aspect to them. So, so, so weight's important. Uh, it's got to survive the, uh, the environment. So we've got operating temperature range, uh, shock. Those are important ones. Rainfall is important. You know, he's got to survive that, envi that outdoor environment, right? So that's how we've come up with these weightings. Note that they eventually they add up to 100%, as you would say, all right? And then we have each of our candidates listed up here. And then we, we have given them uh, the, the book value. So the, the, where processor speed is measured in megahertz. So for this FEX21 guy, it's got 129 megahertz. Uh, this one's got a 92, this one's got a 206, and this one's got a 206, right? So now we're taking uh, that. So, so I figure out my score based on the range of values. So, so for processor speed, my range of values, my worst one's 92, and my best one is 206. Okay, so my 206s get a score of 10 out of 10 because they're the best of all the candidates. Okay, my 92 gets a zero because it's at the very bottom of the pile, and then my 129 is you know uh, uh, you know 3.25 you know, of it, it, I, I figure out this how far is 129 between 92 and 206, right? So and that that's how I figure out my score for that guy. All right. So uh, let's see, you know, and you, so you've got to go through that same process for each one. You come up with, uh, you score its value based on the available range of values and where it falls within that range, okay? And, uh, and then I'm going to uh, multiply the score times the weight, and this is how, this is how I get my, you know, this 30% will now carry, it'll, it'll kind of overemphasize the, in, the, the weight aspect of this whole thing. All right, so I take my, my score times my weight and uh, I come up with a, a result and now, now, now I've converted, this is, now you can see that I've led us down a path to where we can make a very objective decision at the end of the day because I can look at the scores and pick the guy with the highest score, and he wins. All right. So that is uh, that, that's a this is kind of how the trade study all gets wrapped up at the end of the day. All right. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. So how do you determine if it's for like the processor speed versus battery life? How one's five percent, the other's ten percent? Yeah. So you could you could either. You, you could either glean that from documentation that you get that, that would des describe the, you know, the, the objectives of this acquisition is and, and they describe the operational environment, or if you don't have that, you could go to the stakeholders. Remember, the stakeholders are a collection of you know, the end users, the people with the money, you know, the maintainers. You know. So you could do interviews with people to, to obtain that information. You know. um, uh, with like what, I, I did a trade study for my master's project there, my you know, fancy car radio thing, and I, I basically made it up. You know, I, I made up a, a, like a survey form. You know, and then I, I took like 12 of them to work with me one day and handed them out to people and said, okay, fill this in for me, you know, consider, you know, so you could do surveys, you could do, you know, any, anything you can come up with to be able to understand what they are. And then what you could do at the end of the day is go to the customer and say, okay, this is what I think your favorite criteria look like. Do you agree with that? You know, so, yeah, good question. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed that for when you were uh, doing your example on the processor speed, it was mm -hmm. sort of like a linear relationship of score to yeah. whatever the value is. Is it always some linear relationship, or can can you kind of change? You know, yeah, it's 
uh, you know, so j just like everything else in systems engineering, you know, there's no yes or no answer for that. You know, I mean, if it makes sense for there to be a linear relationship, then yes. But, but it, you know, it won't always make sense for, for that to be linear. So, so, th so if it's not linear, then you had those, like, uh, the utility function, these little graphs, you know. So, so those are, there, there's your nonlinear relationships. And so, but how do you come up with those? You know, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. There's probably some subjectivity that came into making those, right? So, um, so it depends. It depends. You have to kind of figure that out case by case. All right, any other questions on trade studying? All right, this is, uh, this is just kind of a, a reference slide that, that, that you'll have access to, so that kind of goes right back over everything we just described, just in one handy little checklist. So if you're ever asked to do a trade study, you can remember where this slide is, and then you can follow the checklist. All right, so that's what I got for you on trade studies. Any last-minute things on there? Okay. All right, we're going to keep uh, plowing through this. I know we haven't taken a break much tonight, but uh, we're almost done, so it would be silly to take a break at this point. All right, last thing I wanted to go over was the uh, little bit on test and evaluation. So uh, first off, uh, I know I've kind of hit this one a few times, but uh, verification versus validation. They are two separate and distinct entities. So uh, just wanted to give you another nice written down definition of what each of those are. Uh, but verification is really what test and evaluation does for you, okay? Yeah, its purpose is to provide objective evidence that a system fulfills its specified requirements. And that objective evidence comes from tests. So uh, the, the, the purpose of your test and evaluation program is verification. As opposed to validation, where the purpose of validation is to provide objective evidence that the system fulfills the business or mission objectives of the stakeholder. So did they buy the right thing at the end of the day? Is the thing that they asked for really the, the, really the thing they needed? So the validation is more a thing that a customer is concerned with rather than the supplier. All right, so the purpose of your system test and evaluation program is to verify compliance to the technical performance measures. So remember our TPMs come from our sort of our, our, our favorite set of requirements. Uh, Uh, the other purpose of your test evaluation program is to, uh, you're, you're kind of trying to expose the system to everything it could possibly see during its subsequent life cycle up front to be able to uncover any shortfalls in the design. All right. Uh, your test program could involve either, you know, a representative piece of the final hardware. It could represent some sub-assembly within there. There's component level testing where I just want to figure out if this one resistor really does the thing that it's supposed to do before I build it into this really expensive antenna. And so, so maybe your test is just for that one resistor and then you graduate on up to eventually be able to test the full system. All right. I can do system, I can do testing in all kinds of ways. I can do simulations. Uh, you know, any uh, aspiring thermal engineers out there? Yeah, me neither. That stuff scares me. <laughs> but uh, but you know, that's what they do. They rely on modeling for a living, and uh, and so you know, we lean on the thermal engineers early on in the design process to come up with 
hey, how hot is this thing going to get? You know, and they, and they use their fancy models and uh, you know, black magic to come up with an answer. And then eventually you build something and then you're, nobody ever trusts the thermal engineer. So eventually you have to circle back and build a piece of hardware and put a thermocouple on it and measure how hot it gets before you ever trust that the results of the model are correct. A terrible, terrible way to make a living. No one ever trusts what you say. Uh, okay, a couple of typical test activities. These are the ones that I'm going to kind of highlight for you to make sure just, just to kind of, I want to give you some new vernacular to put into your toolbox so that you'll recognize these when they come up again. So these are typical test activities that you'll undergo in any sort of a development program. Uh, and um, yeah, so these, we have the, the upcoming slides will kind of describe each of these in greater detail, but you have ESS or environmental stress screening, qualification testing, acceptance testing, reliability testing, or this thing called HALT or highly accelerated life testing. Uh, all your environmental testing is described in uh, this nice mill standard 810. Everybody in the world refers to it. Not this is just not just the military. Uh, everyone kind of looks at this. You know, watchmakers, everybody. This is this is kind of like the go-to manual on on how to define a certain environment. You know, what the, what is a hot desert day? It'll have a definition for it. You know. What is a humid tropical day? I'll have a definition for it. All right. All right, so ESS, or environmental stress screening. The purpose of environmental stress screening is to uncover latent defects, which are like latent defects are, are manufacturing defects that, you know, wouldn't, uh, that, that you can flip the switch and it'll work, but, you know, as soon as you expose it to a vibration environment or a thermal environment, uh, that, that weak solder joint in there uh, breaks and now it doesn't work anymore. So that's what a latent defect is. Something is built into it that you don't know is there with a simple on-off test. All right? So the purpose of ESS is to uncover those early. So it's, it's generally a series of temperature and vibration tests. All right? And typically the thing that you're testing is not having to operate. So if you're making a radio, you don't have to have the radio working while it's being vibrated. You, you, ex you, you verify, you do a health check at the start, you put it in and you, you shake it and you bake it, and then you take it back out and you turn it on again to make sure yeah, it still works. All right? And so, so there'll be a very well-defined, uh, you, you know, either a vibration profile, you know, this many Gs at this rate on this axis, uh, temperature, you know, this hot for this long, this cold for this long, temperature rate changes. So, you know, when you're getting to the hot temperature, you heat it at this many degrees per hour. That's where it all be explained in excruciating detail and it's all explained in that mill standard. So oftentimes it just says test this thing in accordance with mill standard 810 paragraph 52 and then uh, that tells you how to do your your ESS testing. So that's what ESS is all about. Exposure to environment mainly temperature and vibration to uncover latent defects. All right, qualification testing. Qualificate to, huge battery of tests. Uh, lengthy, expensive, uh, and it is supposed to hit all the corners of the envelope of the thing. So uh, take it to the hottest it's ever going to see and the coldest it's ever going to see and shake it the hardest it's ever going to be shaken. And, you know, so you run through this whole thing of, of it's not just the temperature and vibe, but it could be, you know, exposure to, radi you know, electromagnetic radiation, uh, tests for interference, you know, does it interfere with, uh, you know, adjacent electronics. Uh, lightning strikes, so there, there's companies out there that will, you know, strike your thing with lightning for you and, uh, the, the, you know, see whether it survives that or not. Uh, salt fog, sand and dust, uh, rainfall, uh, there's, there's companies that do this testing for a living. So like at Ball Aerospace, we can do most of our own temperature, vibration, but we, we can't do lightning. So we pay, we find another company that will go do a lightning test. I was just talking to a company today in Florida that's going to do our lightning test for us on our antenna that we're making. So 
Um, yeah, so those, those are, and so you'll be told, uh, your customer will tell you exactly which one of those tests they want performed and uh, all the assumptions, you know. So like in the, in the rain test, they'll say, we want, you know, your raindrop has to be this size and impact at this speed at this angle and it'll, it'll all be very clearly described for you. So qualification testing, big set of tests. Uh, exposes it to its entire life of possible extremes. All right, your ATP, your, your acceptance test procedure. Your ATP is what you have to perform and pass for the customer to say, yes, I will take that and I will pay you for it. So it's kind of like your final exam before the article goes out the door to the customer and you will, it is generally not a, not a huge amount of testing because the customer doesn't want to pay for that either, they, but it's enough testing for them to be sure that the thing they're getting uh, you know, works when it came out the door. So it'll be uh, some sort of a series of basic functional tests. Uh, they, they may have to, they, the customer may require that they witness it, that they send someone from their company to actually watch the test take place. Um, if they're buying the thing as a defense article, if they're buying the thing to go on to a piece of military equipment, then the government has people called uh, uh, that work for the Defense Contract Management Agency or DCMA, who will they'll come in and they're qualified to witness the test for you as well. So we have uh, we have I think three DCMA folks that that live at Ball Aerospace. The, the, the Ball is their permanent place of appointed duty. Um, so yeah, that's that's what ATP is. All right, uh, reliability or halt testing. Halt is a type of reliability testing. So th there's a uh, it could consist of multiple cycles of ESS. So just keep doing, you know. It, what you're trying to do with halt is seeing how, what does it take to break the thing. You know, I know we gave you the requirements, but now I want you to exceed the requirements in some incremental fashion until you find the breaking point. And what was it that broke? When it finally broke, what was the weak link? So that's what HALT's all about, is kind of finding where that thing is that's the weak link in the chain that's going to break first. Uh, and then, you know, then you obviously take a look at that and go, do we like those results or does this trigger some sort of a redesign or something? So. What we find um, a lot of times, like if you, it, sometimes you can't break the thing. So, so what, what you have to agree to in a halt test is wh when do we know we've passed? You know, if the thing just doesn't break, we can't just keep testing forever, right? So, so you know, if it's a vibration thing, we will generally say, hey, we'll, we'll expose it to the ESS vibration profile, and then we'll take it up and we'll crank the, you know, turn the, turn the dial up a notch and we'll shake it a little bit harder. And then we'll check it to make sure it's still okay, shake it a little bit harder. And when the dial gets to 11, that's the end. So, you know, we, we can't test it anymore or we risk, you know, breaking our own vibration equipment or something like that, you know. So uh, your typical goal in HALT is to expose it to two full lifetimes worth of whatever it is you're worried about. Vibration's a very typical one. Temperature's another one. So it's usually, you're generally centered around one of those two for just about anything you could make, you know. It's either going to get shaken to death or, or cooked to death, one or the other. All right. Now, when they make airplanes, like when they make the F-18, they actually built an F-18 just to do this halt testing to. And so they took it and they put it on a fixture and they vibrate it 24-7, 365 until something breaks. And they'll, they'll do that for, we, we, on the, in the F-35 program, they did that and uh, it took like two years before the, the first crack showed up in something. And so... Then they stopped it, and by then it had gone through, you know, two full lifetimes of, uh, of vibration because it's been sitting there and vibrated for so long. Anyway, so that's what halt's all about. All right, last slide. 
developmental versus operational testing. So developmental test is any series of tests you do while you are inventing something new, okay? So developmental tests are, are really kind of all those tests that we've just talked about are all good examples of developmental tests. The ESS, the HALT, the ATP, well, not really the ATP. ATP would be for anything that you're going to deliver. But... Uh, uh, but developmental tests are usually, they're very well described. Uh, they're always done in a very controlled environment. So I'm testing vibration, I'm testing vibration only. I'm going to maintain temperature at the same thing the whole way through. You know, when I go to temperature, I'm testing temperature and temperature only in a very specific fashion. So they're very well described. They have very clear pass-fail criteria, all right? Uh, and they ultimately are designed to demonstrate that you meet your measures of performance, okay? Uh, for airplanes, that's what test pilots do. You know, they go out and they go, I want you to fly this airplane at this airspeed, at this altitude, and I want you to roll it at this roll rate. It's always very controlled, very precise. Operational test, on the other hand, is trying to expose it to its intended operational environment. So far less control, Far, far, few, far fewer constraints put on how the article is treated. Uh, it's generally done not by test pilots, but by uh, people who are what they call more representative of the end users, you know. So it's usually guys that have done, like for, for airplanes, it's guys that have done a tour at a regular operational squadron, and they come back to a special operational test uh, unit that, that does this. And so they'll take the airplane out in a simulated environment that's supposed to mimic, uh, you know, its final intended place. All right. So it's kind of a bit more subjectivity put into the results of an operational test, not, not like that in developmental test. All right. Any questions on testing? All right. This is my, my spiel on test. Here's our homework for next week. Already up to chapter three. First three chapters are actually kind of like the longest of the chapters to read. You know, had the most you know, relevant content, I'd say. You know. So pretty soon we'll be talking about midterm exams. So it's going pretty quickly. All right, folks. Thank you very much for your attention. Good job, uh, you know, good luck at your review tonight. <laughs>